Hello, folks. I am John Nigerian, and welcome to another episode of Compound Interests. It's both compounding and interests. Uh, Lou Borsellino. Uh, Lou is a longtime friend, uh, a fabulous trader. We're going to have a good discussion about trading, um, about some of the uh, outside investments that Lou has made, some of them doing just spectacularly well right now because uh, as usual, he's had his finger on the pulse of what's really uh, uh, driving investments and so forth. But folks, for those of you who uh, are not as active in trading, uh, Lou is an S&P 500 legend, a floor trading legend from the Chicago Mercantile Exchange. Uh, came out of DePaul University in Indiana, not DePaul in Chicago, DePaul <laughs> down in uh, uh, Indiana, and uh, was, I think, poli sci and maybe econ or business major. And uh, Lou, I don't want to steal your thunder, but I do want you to tell us a little bit about when you matriculated from college and all of a sudden the whole world is out there in front of you you get hit in the face with something pretty tough to take and then kind of changed your course. Tell us about that. Hey, hi, John. Thanks for having me. Yeah, sure. so, um, you know, local guy grew up in the su southern or western suburbs of Chicago, um, got a partial football scholarship to play at DePaul University, which they called the Harvard of the Midwest at the time. <laughs> but when I, you know, when I uh, visited Harvard one day, I asked them if they were the DePaul of the East. Uh, they didn't know what I was talking about. <laughs> so uh, graduated college, uh, 1979, two days after I gradu graduated college, my father was murdered. Um, I ended up, uh, and uh, you know, he was involved in organized crime. And uh, so uh, had a had to pick up the pieces for my mother and my brother. And uh, ended up, luckily, people don't realize, they think I just kind of stumbled down on the Merc, but I, I drove a, I drove a truck for about a year. My father had a, a trucking company, and then I was uh, um, wanting to go into law school. So I had to take the LSATs. And um, my mother used to work for a gentleman uh, when he was a lawyer, actually two gentlemen, and their names were Maury Kravitz and Leo Malamud. And there was another Both gentleman. Legends. <laughs> yeah, right? So then Maury. Both legends. Yeah. Uh, then, then there was another guy who came out of, who, uh, came out of um, Notre Dame Law School, was looking for a job, and my mom was friends with a cop on the south side of Chicago who used to throw business to the PI attorneys, and uh, that was Jack Sander. So uh, <laughs> I, I, I couldn't, couldn't go wrong for an introduction, right? So I ended up uh, actually getting a job from uh, another guy named Lou Matta. I was playing handball with him at the time, not racquetball, handball. Mm -hmm. And uh, I walked up and tapped Maury on the shoulder, and Maury said, you know, hey, kid, what are you doing here? And I go, oh, you know, I got a job as a runner. He goes, come back in two weeks. You're going to be my clerk. And so that, that was in the goal pit. Ironically, so uh, I got to, I, I got there in like uh, 1981. Um, so it was like the summer of 81, and then uh, you know gold had just risen to uh, about uh, 850 dollars an ounce, and uh, you know it was a hot pit. And actually, CME at the time had all the volume uh, compared to the Comex in New York. So that's how I kind of migrated to the futures world. Um, tried to uh, you know. First year was rough. I had no money, undercapitalized. Under in fact, I was thinking about leaving. And then you talk about a fortuitous event in my life, too. I knew Maury. Second was um, Falcon Islands. If you remember with the Falcon Islands, uh, um, they were, they're going to war with the, with the UK. And um, they sent the warships down there. And uh, uh, gold had risen about $50 in three days uh, per ounce. And then there was a rumor that um, the Falcon Islands surrendered, and then the, grow, the gold dropped $50 in about three minutes. And then, then the rumor came out that that was false, and it rallied back $50. So I was filling orders at the time, and I looked through my orders, and I was matching up with the guys that I traded. You know, you would sign your order, put it in your pocket, sign your order, put it in your pocket. I go to check my order with Mike Manini, I'll never forget it, MMMM, his badge was, I go, Hey, Mike, I sold you 50 at the low. He goes, 
He goes, sh shaking his head. I go, I sold you 50. He goes, ah, I sold you 50. So we were sell, sell. I bought his 50, he bought my 50. I made $72,000 on a trade and I had money to stick around for another year. And then uh, the S&P pit opened up. So that was my, my event, uh, you know. And, you know, that's kind of, I think throughout the years, I, I tell that story because most people who start trading, um, they need about a year, right? They need about a year to figure it out, make all the same mistakes, all the dumb mistakes, and then figure it out. I, I, I used to tell people, if you can break even after one year, you got a good chance of succeeding in this business. Yeah, well, my gosh, Lou, uh, going from being a truck driver uh, to being a handball, you know, playing handball just for the exercise. And folks, if you've not done it, um, firemen play a lot of handball in Chicago. It's mainly, it seems, firemen uh, and, you know, folks that are friends with firemen because every firehouse, Lou, uh, that's where I learned how to trade, uh, how to uh, play handball as well. Um, and some of them have three wall outdoors. So right. there is no back wall. There's no that big scoop trade, like, you know, a yeah. hit like that. But uh, the, it, it's a fabulous sport. It's, you know, your hands get kind of uh, rough and tumble from it but you can't catch it. It's just, it, it can be a scooping kind of whack, but it can't, you can't ever hold the ball or, yeah. you know, it's the other guy's point. Um, and sort it's of like your, your hand is the tennis racket, right? Yeah. So. Your hand and both hands. Yeah. So both you hands. have to be ambidextrous because if that thing's coming over to your left side and you're right-handed, you try to come back like with a backhand every once in a while, Lou, I would do that every yeah. once in a while. You know, just to screw with the guys that I was playing with, I had a pretty good shot where I could just go backhand it into the corner and just go bang, bang, right off the wall into the corner and it would die there. Right. Uh, but I loved uh, handball. It was a great workout. And I'm sure that's how, you know, that friendship, like you talked about, that's how that gets made is on the handball yeah. court. Yeah, I was playing with a bunch of, at the Duncan YMCA, which is actually the Salvation Army, right west of the Loop, right there on Ashland. Mm -hmm. um, they had a, a, a men's club there. And there was a bunch of old Italian guys who played there. I played with these guys that were like 65 years old. And they'd serve the ball, and I'd go to hit it, and it would spin. They would spin it. It hit me in the head. You know, uh, they were, they were quite the characters. Taught, and that's how I learned how to play handball and gin. <laughs> so... <laughs> Uh, but uh, you know, it was a, it was a, it was an exciting time in my life. I, I, oh yeah, and you know, we were both you, young guys. You get to the floor, and you see all the emotion, all the energy, and I'm like, you can make a living doing this. And then, uh, and then when I started making uh, money that I never dreamed of, um, I kept saying to myself, I hope this lasts for five years. I hope this lasts for five years. I hope this lasts for five years. <laughs> it lasted twenty. I knew to get out when I had to get out, but uh, um, it was a great ride. Great ride, met a lot of good people. I think that um, trading, uh, the disciplines of trading and the life lessons you learn in the pit and, and, and taking losses and trading, you can use throughout your life. I mean, it's just, it's, it, you just kind of, you know, even when you talk to private equity guys and, you know, they want to be very sophisticated private equity guys, it's all about risk and how you assess your risk. And, yep. uh, you know, you know, I had a guy, uh, yeah. and Lou, you were, you were there, literally the S and P pit grew up around you. I mean, you know, because when I started on the floor in 81 as well, there was no S and P 500 pit. Right. Um, yeah. I remember Lou, you know, they struggled with this little index called value line right. um, and the XMI and some of these, but, when the when the S and P five hundred started trading, when that future started trading, um, everybody wanted to trade that thing. Um, so th think about ahead. what a what a coup that was. Oh yeah, we we, we the, the the CME got the contract away from New York. I mean, because Comex was going after it, right? And everybody knew that commodities was a Chicago game. Commodities and the CBOE options was a Chicago game, and that uh, the uh, you know, so we got that contract. It was pretty, pretty uh, amazing. And then the first year, I, I want to say the first six months, you know, people don't know this, but, uh, you know, um, I was on the S&P study committee. So we actually, uh, uh, with, 
we went after all our members and asked them to go in there and make at least five trades a day. So we had, you know, a thousand guys going in and out, scratching trades, you know, just to get the volume up, right? And sure. then when the fund managers realized uh, what kind of hedging, uh, hedging vehicle could be, and then the volume just started taking off. Uh, yeah. You know, it's been around forever. I mean, it's, it's uh, there's still a pit. I think the contract at the SCME says that they have to have an open outcry pit to keep the contract. So the S&P pit has not closed down. Now there's like six guys standing in it. <laughs> you know, uh, the heyday, there were 500 of us in there. Right. Crazy. Well, and uh, folks, uh, Jack Sandner is also a friend of mine. Lou mentioned him because uh, he was the guy that was the lawyer from uh, Notre Dame Law School. Uh, and I I'm sure you've seen him more frequently than I have, Lou, but I see him every year around Christmas at a party that we both go to. And uh, he's still got that twinkle in his eye yeah. and uh, it's still all that energy. And he's all about the CME still, still yes. after yeah. all these years. And, yeah. you know, uh, there are only so many guys, folks, that are uh, legends over on that floor. You know, there's Harry the Hat, there's Lou yeah. Borsellino, um, there's Jack Sander, Leo Malamud, of course. Um, and uh, I guess uh, Don Wilson, you know, yes, if we want to go over sure. into the Euro dollar pit, because the CME was smart enough to see a lot of this stuff, Lou, when other people, maybe they thought that the S&P would be, you know, a deal, but not the deal that it became, you know, the number one futures contract in the world. Um, the Euro dollar then topped that. Um, and that pit, the Euro dollar pit, they used to have, Lou, I want to say four or 500 guys, mainly guys, you know, yeah. some women, but, you know, 95% or more were guys, and they were big guys. Oh, you know, see, they, they were 6'5". Six, 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 five. Six, yep. five. And that was in the front month. But, you know, mm -hmm. I, I, you know and people don't realize, I mean, you, you always talk about Jack and, um, and Leo, but the guy that brought both of them to the exchange was Maury Kravitz. Maury Kravitz was literally in 1956, 57, he got out of the army and he was becoming a lawyer and trading at the eggs and butter exchange. Mm -hmm. And that was his passion was the commodity exchange. And before they made gold legal to trade, Maury went around to every brokerage firm and said, hey, if they ever trade gold, I always try to imitate his voice because he was just, he was five foot five by five foot five at one time. His badge was B Z Z because he used to fall asleep if we were sitting there talking to him, right? And uh, you know, then he lost weight and so on. But uh, uh, but Maury went to every clearing firm and said, "Hey, if they ever trade gold, can I be your broker?" You know, and that was like if I, you know, we walk around right now, well, maybe it's not so much uh, uh, out of the question anymore. But if we said, "Hey, if you if you start doing uh, you know rides to the moon, can can I ride on your?" Rocket, you know. I guess Elon <laughs> Musk is uh, as uh, uh, has, has th those aspirations. But so Maury, um, they started trading gold, and his 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 deck, if you remember what decks used to look like, was like two feet thick. He had every order, and that was the first argument that Maury ever had with Leo. Is Leo said to Maury, "You can't have all the orders. You got to share it with other people." And he said, "Why?" <laughs> you know, there, another thing people are like, their company, Delsher, or Leo's company, Delsher, is both of their daughters, Delfina and Cheryl. Huh. So they were, they, were, they were law partners, and then they were partners, and then uh, uh, Leo went one way, and, and we kind of gravitated with Jack and on the other side, but we were all good friends for a long time. Oh, yeah. yeah. Well, um, now... As successful as the S&P was, when the euro dollar really started hitting it, Lou, um, obviously, like you said, and I said, there are these big guys, six five, six foot eight inch basketball players and things like that. So they can see the desk from across the, you know, the pit, right? Because right. for those of you who don't know, um, the pits at the Merck were octagonal shaped pits and they go up multiple steps and then down multiple steps into the center. The biggest traders like Lou and you know the big traders, they're on that top ring because 
you know, they need to be able to see the desk. They can see the orders coming in. You know, the kids bringing the orders, the kids hand signaling orders, all that kind of stuff. They can see that from the top step, but it's coveted. It's tough to get on that top step because if you're on that top step, um, whoever's on the one step below you wants that spot, right, Lou? Yeah. <laughs> Guys have to get there two hours before the pit open and put their cards down, you know, their name and put a card in a spot, you know. Um, yep. It was pretty, very territorial, right? And, and right. Uh, in fact, in, in front of me, I didn't let anybody stand in front of me that was taller than 5'5". Five, five. <laughs> so if any big guys came, I go, all right, you got to move over. You got to move over. But uh, yeah, very territorial. You kind of made a beachhead. Was it for Maury or who was it for in the Euro dollar pit? Because I've heard stories, Lou. Yeah. Uh, so we had a brokerage company together. It was, uh, it was uh, myself, Maury, Jack, uh, Jimmy Kalenis, um, Opa, a couple other guys. There was like 12 of us started a brokerage company. We did about probably 35 or 40 percent of the business on the CME at one time. Mm. Um, actually, uh, yeah, there was a problem in the uh, euro dollar pit, and uh, they basically said, uh, I can't get in there. They keep pushing me out. I'm standing on the step, and they don't make room for me. And I go, Well, you have to fight your way in there and stay there. That's your spot. And he goes, Oh, I can't do it. So I had to go over there and, and stake out our territory. <laughs> <laughs> so it, sure it, sort it was of very like gently. A, it, it started to started look like the protests that are going on right now, the peaceful protests. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. It, was, it was a brawl for about 15 minutes. Uh, but uh, yeah, it was very territorial. I mean, look, at the end of the day, if you get missed and someone couldn't see you, I mean, it could cost you hundreds of thousands of dollars. I mean, yep. to get out of the position, right? So. Um, I was in that business where we, we had the brokerage company and in, in 1986, the Merck made me sell it because uh, they actually put a rule in if you're part of a brokerage group, you can't trade with anybody that's in your group filling orders. So I had to get out of the business because I was not going to preclude, preclude myself from trading. We had four brokers in the S&P pit. They were doing a lot of volume. And, you know, I, you know, I could have a hundred to a hundred car position on and I needed to be able to get out. So I sold that business back then. Just, yeah, just well, you've, started, you've started a lot of businesses, Lou. Yes, um, I did. <laughs> yeah, and uh, a lot of real successful businesses. Um, well, I remember once, Lou, in uh, the financial crisis, the global financial crisis, um, that there was over at the Chicago Board Option Exchange in the S&P 500 pit, the options, of course. So the futures traded over at the Merck, the futures options traded over at the Merck and the equity options on the S&P 500 traded at the SIBO um, at that time. And now they right. trade everywhere. Right. Uh, but back then, um, I, I saw this one friend of mine in the pit one day, Lou, and this isn't a story about, you know, fighting or anything. Yeah. This is a story about once you get in there, once you put your card down and you say, here's my card, that's where I'm going to stand. You stand there all day. And if you move, if you leave, um, sure, if everybody goes to lunch, not everybody, but if some people go to lunch, the pit thins out and then it picks back up and you can probably get your spot back. But if it's busy and rocking, you can't leave. No. If you leave, they'll like, you know, you're, you're nobody. Um, you would have to fight your way back in. So anyway, this friend of mine, um, I see him, he's got khakis on and the whole front of his pants are, you know, it looked like he dropped a whole cup of coffee on him. And I said, what the F happened? You know, what, yeah. what are you doing? And he said, in truth, John, he said, uh, uh, I couldn't leave the pit and I had to pee. So he said, I just <laughs> stood here and pissed. And yeah. I said, are you crapping me? And he said, I got back upstairs. I won't say which firm, Lou. But yeah. he said, I got back upstairs at the end of the day. And I, they all laughed at me. And then I told him, well, if I left the pit, I wouldn't get that spot back until, you know, I fought my way in there and blah, blah, blah. And they figured, you know what? You'd probably lose a couple hundred thousand dollars worth of good trades in the 30 minutes it might take you to get back into that spot. So screw it. We'll buy you yeah. a new pair of pants every day. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Maybe get Actually, one of those I I was, truckers uh, friends. 
when I walked out, there were I had a person who stayed in my spot. <laughs> but yeah. saying, when I came back, he was gone. But yeah, so I had a, a placeholder, I guess, a human placeholder. <laughs> Lou, one time I brought a trader, uh, not a trader, I brought a friend down to the Merc um, when you guys were, uh, were on, and this guy was one of the hogs. Um, he wasn't one of the famous ones because he was a backup, but he was one of the hogs. He played in a Super Bowl. He has the ring and all. Yeah, yeah. And he uh, was six foot seven, 405 pounds. And guys at the Merc, as soon as they saw this kid, because he was a kid, he was like 27, but he was yeah. done with football. You know, he blew out his knee for the last time. He was done. So he was uh, over there, and he wore a size 70 double X jacket. Wow. So he's over there on the Merc, and there were guys like Lou who were coming up to him saying, hey, kid, you want a job? You stand <laughs> right next to me. I mean, yeah. You're going to be my clerk. You stand right here. And that way, nobody could come at him, Lou, from that yeah. side because the kid was so big. He was a wall. <laughs> but guys were doing that back then, right? Yeah. They, they, then they used to have the shoes. Remember the platform shoes? They oh, had yeah. their gym shoes and make eight-inch platforms on them. Yep. Literally eight inches. I mean, if you fell off them, you'd break your ankle. But at the end of the day, and, you know, eyesight and being seen was, was you know, very important. Um, Absolutely. You know, I had a good position, but besides, I was a pr fairly large trader. And so when the big orders came in, you know, they were looking to me to take off, you know, it's a lot easier to go to one guy than 20 guys, right? Yep. It cuts down on your, your choice, uh, your chance of foul trades and so on. Right. And but, just uh, what Lou said at the top of the show, folks, when he talked about that trader who um, was on the other side, you know, the, the, the broker, I mean who said, sold you. And Lou said, no, no, I sold you. So that means yeah. they both owned them. Um, right. And luckily gold went the right way for them. It could have gone the wrong way, but uh, that's known as an out trade. And meaning that, you know, you, that's why you want one name on the ticket if you can, or just a couple. You don't want 20 names because one of those 20 people screws up and it could cost you, could cost you your job. Yeah, you, you know. So when I first got there, um, we were I was filling orders, and if you, remember, if you know this, I don't know about the SIBO what they pay, but we were they were paying us three dollars a contract, right? So it was huge, right? So if I filled two, three thousand contracts in a month, I was making you know six, eight, nine thousand dollars a month filling orders, which was for a twenty-two year old kid, great. But then when I was learning when I was trading, I was making ten times what I was doing trading yeah. versus filling orders, but and, they, and before I stopped filling orders in the S&P pit, they did 100,000 contracts in a day. I was 10% of the volume with what I filled and traded. So I actually bought a membership for my clerk because she was a woman. Her name was Joni Weber. She was the best out trade clerk. And, I, and you couldn't stand in the pit if you didn't have a membership bed. You can you go in and out, but you couldn't stand there. So excuse me, I, I bought her a membership she stood next to me and I would just feed the cards to her and say, what's my count? Long 50, short 20, long 50. So she kept me that. And, and then um, I kind of started this fad at the Merck where everybody yelled at me. And then within three months, everybody had one. It was a trade checker. So literally I hired another guy to go around and check the trades. And of course the badass brokers at first said, yeah, yeah, tell them that. I checked it with them already. It quit bothering me. You know, and then I'd walk over and say, listen, if we have an out trade tomorrow and you didn't check it with my trade checker, you're eating it. Within six months, everybody had a trade checker, which was our way of getting an insurance policy, right? Sure. I mean, the biggest out trade I was ever involved in was a, a, a buy-buy where I bought them and the filling broker bought them. And it was a 200 lot and I was half of the order. And the market opened up 2,000 lower. Oh. Right. So now we're both short, right? It's a million dollar winner, million dollar winner, half a million a piece. The clearing firm comes back to the broker and says, and I'm not going to mention the clearing broker because I didn't like the, I, the clearing firm. I didn't like the firm or did I like the, the manager of the firm? But at the end of the day, I see them saying, look, we want to give this to our customers. You shouldn't get this. Right. So I walk, you know, I listen as I pull the guy on the side, I go, Hey, and, but 
what the, the guy didn't know, we already had a conversation already. I said, listen, Pat, um, if this was a loser, we could prove that you were wrong because there was multiple people on the order. I said, I don't want any of it because if it was a loser, I wouldn't be eating the half a million. You should get the whole trade, right? So it's yours. Now I hear this conversation going on and uh, I walk up in the middle of the guy and I said, hey, we're bye-bye. I want, I'm, I'm not breaking these contracts. I want my, my trade with you. That's it. Walked out. And so covered him, got a check for whatever the winning was, like 470,000. I called my clerk, said, go get me a check for 470, make it out to Pat. And when I put it in his pocket, I said, I go tell those guys, you know, this is yours. It's not mine, but I, I don't want you to get screwed. <laughs> but, I mean, you know, and think about it that back then, I mean, what we did for a living, we had thousands and thousands, and what you still do when you, when you trade, you know, we didn't have a lawyer. There was no contract. There was just, you know, uh, you and the other person uh, confirming a trade and uh, you know, your word was your bond in the, in the, in the, in the market. So it was, yep. a, it was a, a very, uh, I used to tell people my best analogy, it was like being in high school with money. <laughs> <laughs> I like that one, Lou. I yeah, like it's that like being one. in high school. A bunch of guys with too much money, right? The only thing you had to do is stay away from the, 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 the bad habits, which I didn't have any really bad habits, uh, drinking or drugs or any of that. So I was able to last a long time. Yep, you sure did. Yeah. Um, Lou, you told us a little bit about gold already. Uh, do you have an outlook for it right now? I mean, where it is, it's pushing up against AC. But you have, a, I'm sure you follow it still, but yeah. do you have an outlook that says, John, I think it's going to explode through 2000 or, you know, these things take a long time and maybe it just consolidates here. I actually have a very scary outlook about gold because I'm worried about China. Looking at China, if you take a look at China, we've got four point, they hold, hold about 4.3 trillion debt, the US. And it's a known fact that China for the last two decades have been buying gold down in the 300s, 350s, 500. They've been buying it for 20 years. Um, now, and we also know their society is a very um, saving, saving orientated society. But, you know, the problem is that, you know, the government controls all the uh, uh, e-commerce and companies. If they went to sort of a mercantile and freed up their, freed it up, right? Uh, freed up their economy uh, with their uh, people, they could, they could say, look, we're going to, we're going to write off that $4 trillion and we're going to go on the gold standard and back our currency. I'm, I'm concerned about that because you see what's going on with the petrodollars and Saudi Arabia meeting with China. I think that that's a distinct possibility. And I think that's one reason why gold is back up here. I think the all time high is what, 2200, something like that. But I'm concerned about what's going on with China. I mean, there's a, there's a lot of, a lot of issues going on simultaneously in the world right now. You think about, you know, the COVID we just, we just printed $6 trillion, um, you know, one stimulus, you know, people don't realize that really is sort of like 10 times that the ones that, the money that went to the banks, you know, they can, they, once they get the deposit, they can lend it out 10 times. So this, you know, this is going to be a very inflationary period if the economy can recover. Um, I think I, I'm not very optimistic about it recovering until at least, uh, at least a year. We're going to see December. I think December is going to be uh, sort of uh, when you're going to start seeing when, uh, when all the defaults happen. Because you got the stimulus money's kept everybody kind of propped up. Um, if you get um, another stimulus, it takes 90 days before banks could write off credit cards and mortgages and so on. So I think December, January, we're going to actually see how bad the economy has been affected by COVID. Um, how about, uh, Lou, I've also seen years ago uh, some comments from you about Bitcoin or any of the cryptocurrencies. Um, so what, what do you think of those? And yeah, would I you ever... got involved in, in, in Bitcoin, right? Um, mm -hmm. So I started buying some, you know, just small amount of Bitcoin at like 400, 500, $1,000. But then we, in, in 2016, I 
teamed up with a, a gentleman uh, from uh, who's started out in IT. Okay, I've known him since he's 18 years old. He actually married one of my best friend's daughters, and he actually did some IT work for me back in the day. But he went to um, did IT work, then he went to Department of Justice, then went to Bank of America, and he added up a cyber team of about 250 analysts. And um, he left there, spun up a company, and then um, I reconnected with him because he had an idea of doing a holistic cybersecurity company. And I was just rolling out of the worst trade I ever made in my life, and that was I was in the nursing home business, medical field. Uh, literally got caught and squeezed, not only because of 2008, but uh, the state of Illinois owed me $10 million from the Medicaid receivables and couldn't pay me. So that was a very, very hard time in my life for about three, four years. Uh, you know, I, I, I struggled to get out of the business and cost me about 90% of my net worth. So oh. what, what are you going to do, right? And so yeah. they, all my kids were out of college. They're all doing great. They had no debt. My wife looked at me and said, you'll make it back. <laughs> so, so, you know, that's, you know, that, that, it's the life of a trader, right? So I, you know, I got into the, into the nursing home. I, I was right. I started buying nursing home and CCRCs at like $50,000 a bed, and they're at $300,000 a bed right now. So, mm -hmm. uh, but it's very, you need a lot of capital, very, very hard business because you got different payer sources. You know, you got Medicare, Medicaid, private pay insurance. But um, um, it's, a, it's a, and all these lessons that all the businesses I've been in and out of, as I use trading as the has been the backbone, right? It's all about risk. It's all about how much risk am I going to assume? Um, you know, what's the trend in the market, and, and so on. So, um, you know, I started the first Nasdaq stock trading room in Chicago. That ended up becoming Archipelago, which merged with the New York Stock Exchange. Um, that was a ten-year litigation with Jerry Putnam and Marvin Stewart Townsend, and um, I ended up winning a fraud case against them. $15, $15 million judgment plus punitives. And then the appellate court didn't overturn the fraud. They just said that I was already paid because when I sued them, they gave me back the settlement money. So um, I appealed that to the Supreme Court of Illinois and lost the appeal, but I, I, I want a fraud. So I get to tell people I started a company that became the New York Stock Exchange. There you go. Yeah. Wow. But I mean, now, you know, how, the end of the day, about, it's all- How about Bitcoin though? Oh Do yeah, I get back to that, yeah. So. I started buying Bitcoin because I heard about it. And I went to a Bitcoin um, meeting out in uh, California, out in Las Vegas, and saw a bunch of old traders there, right? And everyone was saying, yeah, I'm a, I'm a Bitcoin trader. And I'm like, okay, well, where are you getting out? I mean, all you can be is long. There's, you know, there's no way of getting out of this, right? And so I started buying some and um, you know, had a Bitcoin wallet and just kind of sat there and then in 2017, um, I was contacted by um, somebody out of Texas, right? And I don't mean it's a long way to get to the, what I think of Bitcoin, right? Well, at the end of the day, their, their um, firm got ransomed. And the ransom was um, $8,000 in Bitcoins. And at the time, Bitcoin was probably uh, trading at about uh, $800 an ounce. And he didn't even know how to get Bitcoins. So I went and got the Bitcoin for him. He, emailed the, uh, wired the money to me. I paid the ransom. And sure enough, the, the hackers um, ended up getting their, um, uh, send them the encryption keys and they were up and running, right? And they were concerned that, you know, if we give them this 8,000, are we gonna be up and running? And I'm saying, look, if they don't do this, their business is destroyed. They're in the business of, you know, encrypting files and getting paid. It's like kidnapping. If you don't give the baby back, no one's ever gonna pay you, right? So. That's what happened. So I started looking at Bitcoin a, a differently. I actually became an expert on the dark web, started going on the dark web, looking at uh, the different marketplaces. I mean, literally people don't realize the dark web is like, you can transaction, you can do any transactions you want in the world on the dark web. And, um, you know, all illegal transactions and how are they paying for this? They're paying for it in cryptocurrency, mostly Bitcoin. So um, as I was watching Bitcoin, um, in May of 2018, I watched it go from 1,000 to 2,000. And what happened? 
Uh, it went from April, I'm sorry, May from May uh, to the end of April, it spiked up a thousand points. And what happened? The WannaCry virus hit. So in a month, all the, all the firms, there was 150 uh, countries, I think it was over uh, 150,000 companies got hit with Bitcoin ransom. And you saw it increase 100%. So I kind of looked at Bitcoin, Bitcoin ransom as the leading uh, economic indicator for cyber crimes. If you see Bitcoin going up, now there were a couple of things that fueled it, right? Number one, speculation. Number two, the important thing is that transactions on the dark web are done in Bitcoins. And uh, so then, in October, I watched it spike up from 2,000 to 4,000. And sure enough, what came out? Equifax, 150 million records, right? So the hackers take, take these records and they start putting them on the dark web. Now, when we say records, they're my, you know, you got Equifax, they've got your social security number, they got your address, they got your wife's name, your name, and so on. What do the hackers do with this information, right? Number one, they file false tax returns. Number two, they will they'll get uh, destroy your credit by getting credit cards in your name, right? So, so the hackers actually there's a marketplace you can go in there and buy records anywhere from fifty cents per record to a hundred dollars per record based on uh, how new the records are. Uh, the most coveted record are medical records because with the medical records you have everything: name, address, insurance, social security, prescriptions, so on. And so uh, the hackers can take those and do all the things I just talked about. And, you know, and then now they're, they're buying illegal prescriptions to sell them on a black market and so on. So um, I had wrote an article back in 18 that I thought that Bitcoin was leading leading economic indicator. And then I said, when futures come out, which the CME offered, I said, we'll spike up to about 10,000. And then after that, I don't know, I have any idea what's going to happen. And sure enough, as futures came out, we spiked up to 10. I think our high was 18,800. It broke back down to four, and now we're sitting there around 10,000. I think that Bitcoin, as long as it's the currency for criminals, it's going to be, uh, it's going to, it's a, you know, it's a viable currency. Now, the other cryptocurrencies, I don't really follow that much, um, but blockchain is here to stay. They're now using a lot of blockchain for cybersecurity, uh, a lot of blockchain for, I'm involved with a company right now that does 3D printing for um, basically what they do is they digitize the blueprints for the Air Force and they take the digitized blueprints and they will transmit it to the Air Force to build a product with a 3D printer. They're doing that to submarines that can't, can't, uh, and can't come up. So um, I think that blockchain, which, you know, the blockchain ledgers is going to be a, a key to security, key to a lot of different industries as we move forward. But um, a lot of hype around all this. Oh yeah, well, Lou, but it leads perfectly into a company that, uh, you know, Defend Edge, a company that you're a big part of, right? I mean, oh, yeah. this, so, this is what, everything you just described is why you're all behind Defend Edge, right? Oh, uh, look, so here's, here's the statistics and everybody sees it, right? So, um, there's a couple, a lot of dysfunctional things that I that I, I actually equate to trading, right? So what's you know you and I know that trading is all about risk. It's all about prioritizing risk, right? Yeah. And so I was able to adapt to this market um, fairly quickly because I understand risk. And then you got to look at the disconnects. And there's a lot of disconnects in this industry because the everyday guy like you and I, even when we were first trading, and these IT guys came around. We didn't really understand their language, right? So when you think about, you know, I, I've been a member of a lot of golf courses, play a lot of golf, have a lot of high profile friends. And when I got into the business, I would go speak with them and say, hey, what are you doing about cybersecurity? They go, I don't know, talk to my IT guy. And then, and then I realized that this is the only industry in these companies that the CFO and the CEO have no skill set to argue with. They can't go down to the IT guy and say, hey, are we safe? And he says, yes. How do these, he can't argue with them. What's he going to say? Oh, what kind of firewall are we using? What kind of endpoint do we have? Are we doing penetration testing? Um, have we ever been breached? Uh, what are we doing for our data backups? You know, this is a whole new language. And then on top of that, IT is IT. Cybersecurity is cybersecurity. It's sort of like the difference between an options trader and a futures trader. 
or a future trader. <laughs> Everybody, you know, for years would say to say to us, "Hey, what do you think of this stock?" Well, I don't trade stocks; I trade S and P futures, right? So, yeah, you might have some basic knowledge as the IT director, but the hackers are so smart, they're so so far advanced um, that um, uh, it's its own discipline, right? And most companies are pro are not proactive yet; they're still reactive. So, for example, the company at I was up at 5.30, gigantic logistics company, you know, billion dollars a year in revenue. They are locked down and can't do anything. And there's a, there's a ransom on there. And the, the sad part about it is for the last couple of years, I've been talking to the owner saying, hey, what are you doing about it? Oh, no, our guys say they got it covered. I got a real sheepish email or text message, 5.30 in the morning from his IT guy. What can you do? I, I, I can't do anything now. We got we got to find a, a way to you know get get out of the problem, right? It's like working out of a bad trade. Got to work out of it backwards, right? So um, yeah, cybersecurity. I think they're telling you by 2021 there'll be six trillion dollars lost globally, and they'll spend a trillion and a half dollars defending it. So it's a very it's a growth business. Not a lot of expertise. Um, I'm fortunate. My partner's been in it for 23 years. I'm kind of sort of learning it through osmosis, right? Um, we have real uh, active uh, partnership with DePaul, IIT, and uh, DeVry. So we got, a, you know, we have five interns working for us every semester, and then we train them and keep the best of breed with us. It's, gotcha. a, it's well, and Lou, it's uh, DefendEdge.com, right? That's right. the company. Yes, it is. Yes. And companies can sign up with that for. Um, doing various types of cybersecurity for their firm? Yeah, so we do, uh, we, we do a lot of stuff like penetration testing, right? Penetration testing is like getting a physical, right? We'll come in, we'll, we'll do a pen test of your network, and then we give you a report on your vulnerabilities, right? And then, um, then we'll uh, put a remediation plan together, and then we talk about your technology, and we talk about a plan moving forward, right? So if you've been fortunate not to have been hacked, over a one to two year, um, a one to, one to two year period, we'll build a cyber fabric, and um, we'll um, uh, keep you secure, right? Because we'll monitor your network twenty four seven, and so on. Um, like I said, this very dysfunctional business. It's sort of like, sort of like you know, you know, I coach high school football, right? Mm -hmm. and, I did hear that that you yeah, were doing. And I, I get, in six years, I got four state championships, right? Nice. So uh, everybody thought it was like you know. How do you, you know, what do you watch the NFL and take their plays? No, fundamentals, fundamentals, fundamentals. I put the spread offense in, fundamentally, we were better than the teams we played, right? And the same thing with, with cybersecurity. There's three things to it. There's emerging technology, right? And everyone thinks if I buy the best technology, you know, I'll be okay. Well, the big companies I walk into, they've got 30 security products on their shelf that they don't know how to use, right? So it's technology. It's quality control process, like you and I would do our research, come up with our buys, our sells, where we're going to put our stop, and we had a plan, right? And then we had quality control, like if the, you know, people used to think, you know, when you have the winning trades, you learn from them. No, you learn from your losing trades, right? So keeping a quality over your process, and then the final part to the cybersecurity is the fact that there's not a lot of resources, right? So if a company doesn't have a cybersecurity analyst and resources to put a plan together and to mesh this all into a cohesive uh, cyber fabric, we do all of that for them. So those are the things that are, you know, that, that's going on um, with cybersecurity. Um, and then there's a, there's a, another, I call it the, the venture capital effect. Venture capital support $10 billion over the last four years created 800 additional com companies. So even if I had a spare million dollars right now, all our growth has come organically because there's so many companies out there saying that they're, you know, the end all be all. So you really got to be able to get to the, to the decision makers in organic growth um, and, and have good partnerships. Um, I think actually the other things that are driving this market right now are insurance companies. Think about a bank that has loans to companies that don't have cyber cybersecurity in place. I told the banker the other day, I go, you're on the red their cyber risk. You know, if that, if that company gets hacked and you know, the, you know, people look at cyber insurance like, oh, well, you know, I can, you know, I'll get a new server and I'll get new this and I'll get new that and do that. But 
the 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 thing that they can't get is they can't rep they can't repair their brand name damage. They lose customers because they're worried about that their networks have been infected, right? Or they're in an industry like healthcare. If you've been hacked, they can't use you anymore. So there's a lot of unknowns when it comes to cybersecurity. That's why it's such a difficult market right now. Lou, um, I really appreciate your time. Let me ask you just one more question, if I could. Go ahead. Um, and I'm sure it's one that caused you to, you, you've still got your hair. I don't. <laughs> um, so congratulations Thanks. on that. But well, it's um, white. It's very white, you as think, you can see. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think about uh, high frequency trading and these algorithmic, you know, the way the market drives up and down, uh, you know, 500 points at a clip uh, when these guys get a, a, you know, an algorithm leaning one way or the other. What are your thoughts on that? So what do you got about five firms now that replaced 8,000 traders that were doing the same thing? Yeah. Basically. Right. So, you know, it was all, you know, I, I saw it because I followed the archipelago and I watched what they did. They went from an ECN becoming a market. Then they got rid of the short, short rule. And that's how they merged with the New York stock exchange. But these, you know, like jump trading and all these, and all these different traders. I mean, that's another podcast. I can, I can tell you basically they're either trading in front of a customer order or they're trading on information other people don't have. Right. So at the end of the day, you know, it's, it's the same thing, right? They get in front of buys, they get in front of sells, and they're actually driving the cost up of transaction costs by you not to be able to buy that. You know, think about all the millions and millions of people that are investing in a 401k and you, you put money into a mutual fund or ETF or something, and you have to pay up because you got high frequency traders in front of you. So it is what it is that there is a, a new exchange coming out, I heard. Um, called the uh, the members exchange and they're literally going after the NASDAQ and the members are Goldman, Merrill, Merrill Lynch and so on. I actually was in a meeting the other day. Um, so I, I heard that's coming out because of the, because of the high frequency trade. So I, I'm not, I'm not a big fan of it. You know, um, I think everybody, I think what they should do if they're going to stay electronic there should be a governor. So everybody gets to the market at the same time, right? Just because you have faster um, high frequency uh, wires up, which should, you shouldn't have that advantage, right? Trading is about knowledge of uh, fundamental, right? You're a good stock picker, you're a good options picker, or you know, you're a good futures trader. But um, you make your money because you have faster access is not, I don't think it's a fair environment. Lou, I appreciate your time, sir. Thank Great you. insights today. And uh, we will dial you up for another uh, podcast on uh, some of the HFT issues and algos later on. Yeah, so, that'd be great. I got some good stories around that. <laughs> okay. Folks, right. uh, Lou Borsellino, um, Defend Edge is that uh, cybersecurity platform that we spoke about. Um, and to Defend Edge and uh, to uh, the things that Lou's involved in at the end of the podcast. So thank you for listening. Lou, thanks for your time, sir. Nice seeing you, John. Let's get together and launch when this COVID shutdown. <laughs> Let's do it. Thank you, Lou. Right, you got it.